Welcome to the Friday edition of Juan's World. I'm continuing my topic of magic and religion and science and today I'm going to try to put some things together in relation to all three and I'm also going to start to unpack a little more the problems with making this classification that things that we call religion sometimes involve thing, what we call magic and what we call science. Sometimes science involves a little bit of magic, sometimes magic involves a little bit of science, whatever. And in, in any culture, you will find all three. It's not so much that one kind of culture is dominated by one over the other, Although you might think that, for example, the contemporary U.S. places a great deal of emphasis on science, but it, it's not by any means 100%. There's an awful lot of religious thinking in, in the country. There are a great many people who deny the, um, the theory of evolution or should I say theories of evolution, there are many of them. There's constant debates going back and forth about creationism and so forth. So within one culture you can have a, a multiplicity of worldviews and that's the main point I want to make, but I also want to make the point that magic, religion and science are not in any sense walled off categories as was believed in the 19th century. So let's get down to specifics. If we go back to the definitions that I gave a week ago of magic and religion and science, I can deepen them a little bit and in the process I can show you why they're problematic. Now remember that 19th century anthropology believed that there were stages of cultural evolution. The oldest was savagery um, involved with um, cultures that hunted and gathering, gathered for a living, uh, used stone tools and so forth, and then barbarism, which involved the domestication of plants and animals and the use of metal tools and civilization that involved uh, the development of cities and uh, industrialism. And along with those three stages of cultural evolution were three worldviews. Savagery was associated with magic, uh, barbarism was associated with religion, and civilization is associated with science. And just even if you know anything about history, you'll know that that is not a really solid or firmly grounded uh, taxonomy. Uh, that, for example, Greece, according to 19th century anthropologists, should be placed in barbarism. Um, they didn't have industrialism, obviously, but they certainly had Science, they had people like Archimedes <laughs> and Pythagoras, Euclid, uh, the found, very foundations of science, Aristotle, 
So, but at the beginning, that type, that uh, taxonomy is nonsensical. In some ways, the classification of ancient Greece as barbaric is both ironic and also an indicator of the problem with the taxonomy. Uh, ironic because the word uh, barbarian uh, in Greek, barbaros, <laughs> it means not Greek. <laughs> it means the people who are lesser than us, that we are the superior uh, culture. And it's true of all cultures that they think that they are the best and that everybody else is inferior. And so you can see that the savage, barbaric, civilized taxonomy is inherently ethnocentric. It's Victorian English anthropologists saying we are at the pinnacle of success and cultural evolution and everybody else is trying to catch up with us. And we know that that taxonomy is just nonsensical, that different cultures are changing, they're not necessarily evolving, they're changing, and they don't all want to be Victorian England or part of the Industrial Revolution. Some of them are very happy doing what they're doing, uh, which is different. But I, I want to take that taxonomy apart a little bit and show its weaknesses and show how not only that the magic religion and science taxonomy by itself is not helpful, but also to just completely take apart the idea of a debate between religion and science. And I am sure that in future weeks I will start pursuing <laughs> a similar uh, thought concerning atheism and theism and so forth. Although I've done a little bit of that in the past. So let's just, um, I, I want to look first of all at magic and science. And what I want to say is that in a lot of ways they share properties. That they are both in a sense empirical, although in different ways. They have different methodologies, that's true. But last time I was saying that science is somewhat different from magic in that it wants to find the mechanism behind something that works. But, you know, it's a dirty dark secret that that's not always true. Okay, so let me go back to the example I gave of baseball from George Gmelch. What George Gmelch says is that uh, batters in baseball often indulge in magic when they're in a slump because there doesn't seem to be any way to get out of the slump and they've tried everything and so they'll try magic and sometimes it works. Now that's just empirical evidence. Why it works is controversial. Uh, probably building confidence has something to do with it, but we don't really know for sure. But we do know that people who practice magic, whether they be baseball players or um, farmers or um, people who are sick, whatever, they're doing it because they have some belief in it through some kind of evidence. And you're, you should say, well, yes, but they don't have the grand theories that science has. And to a certain extent, that's true. But you also have to remember that there's a great deal of trial and error in science. 
and the mechanism often is not understood. The best case in point is gravity. I mean, <laughs> now there are flat earthers who deny that gravity exists at all. Well, that's, that's really bizarre. But accepting gravity does not mean that you understand how it works. We don't entirely. We un there are a lot of parts of gravity that are understood quite well. For example, the acceleration due to gravity in a vacuum. We understand that very well because it's, um, it's measurable. Um, but Newton's um, laws of gravity have to do with how it can be seen to work, not, not, not the mechanism behind it. And Einstein completely upturned uh, Newton and proposed uh, gravity involving the um, distortion of space-time. But he still doesn't have a mechanism. We think we found gravity waves. And when I say we, I don't mean anybody remotely, uh, including me. <laughs> One of the nice things about Mandarin Chinese is that when we say we, it can mean we including you or we excluding you, the inclusive and the exclusive we. In this case, when I say we have possibly discovered gravity waves, I mean somebody has. <laughs> but we still don't fully grasp how it all works. Well, take something as simple as aspirin. Aspirin has been known for its analgesic powers for a very long time. We still don't really understand how it works as a painkiller because we don't really, really fully understand pain. But we use aspirin all the time as an analgesic because it works. So I'm not saying that, there is a, that there's no difference between magic and religion, I mean magic and science, don't get me wrong, I'm, there's a very big difference, but I'm saying that there is a very sloppy boundary between the two because there are certain um, needs for empirical evidence in both. And I would argue that if a magical practice is 100% unsuccessful, it would be dropped. It's the fact that it, it, it is successful some of the time, and more than chance, that's the whole point. If uh, getting better was a matter of 50-50 um, from something, or even higher, like a, co a common cold, let's say, um, you're going to get better from a common cold. 99% of the time. So taking some magical uh, procedure is not going to, is not going to, you can't say that works because you're going to get better anyway. I'm talking about magic that works over and above chance or coincidence. And things that don't work, whether they're magic or science, get dropped. So there's a degree of empirical testing for magic and science. That's because magic and science hinge on cause and effect. They are not dependent on a supernatural uh, entity, gods or angels, devils or what have you. Whereas the basic definition of religion is that it is dependent on the supernatural. And here is also where I want to make things a little bit more complex. Because I think that the 19th century definition of religion was based on Christianity. And maybe, you know, add in Islam and Judaism, what are called sometimes the Abrahamic faiths, because they're all loosely based on the similar texts, um, and Abraham is considered to be a founder in all of them, or a patriarch in all of them. But Buddhism 
and Hinduism and shamanism and what have you are quite different and as I mentioned at least um, last week you can be a Hindu and not believe in any God uh, you can be a Buddhist and not believe in a God so that the existence of a deity is not really a good defining quality of a religion. But in the 19th century, the idea which I said before comes probably from the Abrahamic tradition is that prayer is the key ingredient and not only is prayer involved but morality is involved as well that is you have to be a good person according to the moral precepts of the religion for God to really want to take notice if you're a bad person then he's not going to and there's also an idea that if you're a bad person that you're going to get punished and you'll hear this again and again and again among um, evangelical Christians in the United States. Like the pandemic right now, or catastrophic flooding or tornadoes. Evangelical pastors will, will say this is God's punishment because as a society we have been bad. And bad can mean anything, but quite often in contemporary the United States, it means either um, practicing abortion or con condoning homosexuality. Okay, well, I, you know, I'm not going to get into all those details, but but the point that the 19th century anthropologists were trying to put across is that religion is a uh, a question of intention uh, in relation to prayer uh, good intentions make prayer more powerful than bad intentions and that a deity is involved and as I've already shown that's a very very weak ethnocentric image of religion uh, that it's it's taking like Christianity or Judeo-Christian uh, ideas are somehow central to what a religion is and that just doesn't hold water. So after all of that uh, rambling on, what are we left with? Um, what I'm going to suggest is that we're left with a mess. We're left with a mess on several fronts. That is, if you take uh, somebody at random from the United States or from Germany or China or Cambodia, wherever, you're not going to find an easily definable set of beliefs and worldview. You can't just say, well, okay, this person from Cambodia is a Buddhist. Might be, might not be. You, um, you can't do that any more than you could do with ancient Greece. You can't just pick, pick somebody out of ancient Greece and say, this person believes in the pantheon of Olympus, uh, uh, Zeus and uh, Athena and um, Minerva and all of that. You know, there's a lot of ancient Greeks who thought it was nonsense and some who were very devout and, uh, who, and who prayed to shrines and others who were very scientific. Uh, I don't know that we could necessarily say that there were any atheists in the modern sense, but probably some that came pretty close. And if you take just, you know, like pluck the average person out of the United States, some of them are going to be deeply evangelical Christians, some of them are going to be rabid atheists, some of them may even believe in magic. 
But I would suggest that the vast majority have beliefs that are kind of all over the map. They're, they've got a little bit of uh, magic or superstition knocking around, a little bit of religion of some sort knocking around, um, and probably not a whole lot of science, a whole lot of logic uh, knocking around. Um, but some sort of general mixture of all three. And what I'm given to wonder is whether we can, whether we can ever define a culture as having a specific worldview with a specific magical, religious, and scientific scientific ideas blended in a way that is easily identifiable. I don't think so. I, I think that it depends on what you're doing. Like if you're trying to fix your car, <laughs> I would suspect that you are heavily scientific that you don't do magical or religious things. You don't get to your car which can't start in the morning and say a prayer. <laughs> you might. Now, there is a case where you might. Um, but if, if you crank it 10 or 12 times and it just still won't start, then you're going to be scientific about it. Like, are you getting... Um, any electricity? Is it turning over? Or is it just dead? And if it's just dead, then it probably your battery's dead. And that you change out your battery. You do scientific things. If you um, if you have a headache, I expect <laughs> you again. You might pray, but you'll probably take an analgesic and and so forth. In different spheres of, of behavior, we can sometimes change our worldview. And what a number of people on YouTube will say is, well, um, science is going to win in the end because we only use magic and religion in those areas that are uncertain. And as soon as we gain certainty, it's because of science. Okay, well, it's that way of thinking that I'm not happy about. Because as I spoke about in, um, uh, in previous videos, there are areas where we really don't have much understanding at all. And consciousness is one of those areas where we're just beginning to break the surface and see that there's a lot more going on. Or dreams, or even sleep. There's not really a very good medical explanation for why we sleep at all. I mean, there are things that happen when we sleep which are beneficial to us, and certainly if we don't sleep, <laughs> we go crazy and die. <laughs> there's no doubt about that. But why we dream is real, and, and what dreams are, and their relationship to consciousness, and conscious, the relationship of individual consciousness to group consciousness, to the possibility of the existence of a universal consciousness, and so forth. Those are all very poorly understood. But for millennia, consciousness was the domain of religion. And now it's beginning to seep over into science. So I hope what I've done, if nothing else, is muddy the waters, is to um, show that everything that I've said previously was simplistic, although I was trying to just form a basis for understanding different worldviews. And from now on, I'm going to get a little bit more complex, although I don't exactly know <laughs> what my Tuesday video is going to be about um, because I haven't given it a lot of thought. 
But in the meantime, tell your friends, like and subscribe, and I'll come up with something brilliant <laughs> for Tuesday. Bye.